Good morning, everybody. Um, can you hear me okay? Great. Uh, I have 15 minutes of fame. I'm going to try to stick to it. So there we go. Um, okay, so uh, on behalf of the Board of Trustees, the co-presidents, the faculty and staff at Tacoma Community College, I want to again uh, welcome you to our campus. Uh, this conference has been hosted by us in various forms for a long time, and we're always very excited to host. And I'm really excited to be here for the first time. Usually, uh, I'm unable to attend, so it's a, a delight to be with you. Uh, I want to open with a confession, and that is that the great speech I have spent a lot of time working on was totally excoriated by a former colleague, uh, Michelle Stevens, who goes to the Canvas conferences all the time and said, you can't give that speech. And I'll, I'll explain why at the end, but uh, I hope you'll bear with me as I try to um, walk through this a little bit. Michelle was right. Um, I was going a little dark and a little too futuristic on, on the speech, and what I really want to talk about uh, is, is what kind of evolution we've seen as it relates to the use of learning management systems and instruction. Um, and what I'd like you to imagine is the trip that uh, my partner and I took to Utah many years ago, and just think about lots of sun and great landscapes and driving a car, because that's going to be the metaphor of the day. Uh, imagine learning as driving a car across a great landscape. And for many students, uh, they may not even understand the context with which they're seeing things as they, as they ride along in that car or drive that car. Uh, in the mid-90s, I was one of the first faculty at my campus to develop online courses. And in fact, uh, I'm still really proud of the fact that I developed the first fully online uh, science laboratory course at Parkland College in Illinois. Uh, we used all kinds of incredibly wacky tools. Uh, we used forms of email that are almost unrecognizable today. We used a, a system called First Class. Has anyone ever heard of First Class? Hey, all right, somebody way back there. Uh, we, uh, we, of course, used WebCT, which remains one of my favorites, uh, mostly because I could create algorithmically driven exams for mathematics. I, I'm a chemist, so, uh, so that was a lot of fun. Uh, and Blackboard. So we use these tools in succession, and there were all kinds of um, incredible innovations happening um, at a time when the challenges of trying to deliver synchronously and asynchronously, assess common outcomes at a distance, and translate content intended for uh, a laboratory onto a kitchen counter uh, were really some of the most exciting work I've ever done. It was the Wild West, and if any of you in this room were around at that time, you can remember the new tools that were being thrown out into the environment all the time. There was no such thing as quality matters, very little attention to instructional design, and I saw many colleagues crash as they got distracted by shiny things. So imagine the car, okay, new tool, off into the ditch, right? Uh, sadly, their passengers, our students, crashed alongside. By the time I began teaching design of learning systems and technology transfer at the University of Illinois, Students and I were co-creating handbooks using a wiki. Uh, we used Moodle as our LMS at that time, heavily embedded with video and synchronous two-way communication. The e-learning context had matured, and several great books had come out about instructional design and how to teach well in that context. Today, I don't think it's hyperbole to say that teaching in an LMS is no longer innovative. It's traditional teaching. I'm going to say that again. Learning to drive in higher education today means having a basic competence with a variety of, de of delivery methods and instruction and, and approaches. The LMS is the traditional vehicle for delivery today, and you better know how to drive it. Thank you. Good instructional design and methods are requisite for that course. The maturation of LMS systems is very similar to that of cars, frankly. In the early days of the car, there was no standard model, and early photos showed all kinds of wacky stuff sticking out of cars, different numbers of wheels, uh, steering wheels on various sides, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but standards have emerged in the United States, and there are certainly key essentials that you recognize whenever you get into a car in the, that's been purchased in the United States today. Um, whether you borrow a neighbor's car, drive your own car, or rent a shiny new one, you pretty much know what to do. The great LMS systems, and I include Canvas in this, have found ways to incorporate incredibly cool tools without requiring the driver to get out and read the manual. The ride is smooth, the driver and passengers can remain focused on the horizon, 
and the pure joy of wind in one's hair, a bit of wildlife, and stunning vistas, accompanied by some great tunes, are all that. The car doesn't get in the way that augments the trip, and that's how it should be with learning. Unlike cars, the driver doesn't always get to choose the model, and this can create some problems. If you, as a faculty member, want to drive a fast car with poor gas mileage just because you want to go really fast, it has to be in the same model of LMS as that safe car with great gas mileage that somebody else might want. There are challenges well beyond my technical capacity, but they do raise questions that conferences like this can help explore. How do you pack all these models into one great car and use them in a way that, that don't get in the way of student learning? Lastly, and perhaps most exciting, technology-mediated education has grown increasingly open and authentic. We are moving from teaching to learning to knowing, and inherent in knowing is creating meaningful connections to what students already own. Student voice, co-creation, and real lear world learning are at our fingertips, and a, an equity-driven agenda needs to be present in our LMSs in the same way it needs to be present uh, in our classroom, our face-to-face -face classrooms on campus. A knowledge-driven educational system develops and measures competencies using learning portfolios, robust analy analytics, continuous alert, as opposed to early alert, all expertly balanced with technology tools by the hand of a master teacher who has committed their livelihood to facilitating student knowing. Yes, this means sometimes you're gonna have to pull over and let the students drive. The most exciting aspect of that trip we took in Utah was when we pulled away from Canyonlands National Park and decided to go to an unplanned unit called Rattlesnake Canyon. Has anyone ever heard of Rattlesnake Canyon? Um, if you have seen the movie where the guy got his arm pinned and he lost part of his arm, the car, the parking lot's the same parking lot. So that's my claim to fame. Um, we hiked six miles in where my partner, who's an anthropologist, spent an hour looking at the most stunning petroglyphs I've ever seen. It was an unplanned part of our trip. It wasn't in the syllabus. But we, we went off course and we found something incredible. If this is really about student learning, we have to find ways to give them the ability to drive at least part of the time so they can see something they find exciting. Technology has created huge opportunities to increase access, affordability, and success. In fact, there are incredibly exciting sessions over the next few days around accessibility, reduction in costs using open educational resources, and great tools in Canvas for advising che checklists, just-in-time feedback, synchronous and asynchronous peer instruction. I'm as excited as you are to learn about uh, many of these in the sessions, and I want to acknowledge the faculty and staff at TCC and all of you who are presenting from other institutions who are participating. As the toolbox is in use for online, hybrid, and even face-to-face -face classes, learning management systems have indeed become the traditional classroom of our generation. So I want to summarize uh, at the end the speech I was going to give. Uh, and now you'll wonder why, uh, why Michelle was so right in saying don't give it. Uh, on the horizon, car manufacturers are beginning to design machine-driven cars. I anticipate that machine-driven learning will grow as well. I expect that there are some great benefits of using artificial intelligence in instructional settings. But I still believe that great learning is facilitated by intimate moments between student and student or faculty and student based on a shared understanding of where the learning is going and how one is going to get there. This is not machine learning, it's you. Without you, Canvas would be like a pretty car on a car lot, looking good but with nowhere to go. But driven well, Canvas creates opportunities for engagement, experience, communication, collaboration, and are out of this world. So grab the wheel, drive fast, and have a great conference. Thank you. Okay, good morning. Uh, good morning. Hi. Uh, I'm Scott Dennis. I'm the Director of Community at Instructure, and I'm happy to be here with you today. Okay, great. All right. So I wanted to start with a story this morning. So let's go back to 2010, call it uh, July 14th, because that's the date that it was. And 
I was working for the, the state board here, the SBCTC, and I was, I was really bummed out, a lot of us were, because the learning management system that our faculty and students were using, um, it had, was announced that a competitor had purchased it and was going to take it offline. And so all the work that people had done, teachers getting their courses ready, students figuring out how to use this stuff, the e-learning people supporting, like all out the window. So we were, we were pretty bummed. And a friend of mine uh, from, from Tacoma actually, Andy Duckworth, uh, told me about this little startup company in Utah that were doing some interesting things. So I got online and I found out they had a, a way to use the software for free. And I got logged in, got a sandbox, and thought that well, this is cool. And then I found out they had all their user documentation was out on the internet. Anybody could read it, which was kind of new at the time. And so that was exciting. And then I found out they had these um, these little these user forums you could go into, like message boards, and you could ask questions. And there were people from the company and um, you know engineers and and different people. And there were a lot of users who were in there. And so um, this is supposed to be Utah, right? Uh, so I'm uh, sitting in my, my house in Longview, Washington. Um, I'm asking lots of questions in these forums. I'm, I'm testing stuff in the software. And um, while I'm doing that, the phone rings. And I pick it up. And it's a man in Plano, Texas named Jason Gilbert. And Jason explains to me, he says, you don't know me, but I read the questions that you posted in the forums, and I thought, rather than type out answers, it would be easier to Google stock you and find your landline. <laughs> and so I'm calling you to answer your questions. You know? So he proceeds to answer my questions. He said, I, I wrote them down. And he is answering them. And 45 minutes later, I'm saying, Thank you so much. You've helped me. This is great. You know, and he said, "Wait, wait, wait. There's still two questions that you asked that I haven't answered yet. Let me, let me answer your questions." And so this man who doesn't know me, he's not, he's not an employee of a company. He works at a community college, just like me. Um, he, he called me up and he spent an hour of his life helping me, uh, for no other reason that we use the same software. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. Like, this is, when, is, when does this ever happen? You know, so that that really stuck with me. Uh, to come back to 2017, um, this is a screenshot from my phone. Uh, how many people has anybody used this? Be my eyes, anyone? Oh, get on there and get it. It's cool. So, be my eyes is, a, is an iPhone app that lets blind people contact a network of sighted volunteers in live video. Okay, Simple idea. You've got your phone, if you're a sighted person, and a little alarm will pop up, and you better answer it quickly, because it's only going to be about two seconds before it goes away. And if you get there on time, um, you'll see the video feed of a blind person, and they'll be able to hear you, you can talk to each other, and they'll hold their phone up and they'll say, you know, what am I looking at? And you can help them. Pretty cool. Yeah. So they have some, in their, their interface on the app, there's some stats that they have at the bottom that, that you know, continually incrementing stats. And you can see that there have been 207,000 times that someone has been helped with this app. And there are 33,000 blind people that have been helped. So um, I don't know if that means that there are 30,000 blind people that have been helped six times each, or <laughs> if there's some blind people that have been helped a lot. <laughs> I don't know, but the, but the number that's the most compelling for me that's on that screen are the 482,000 sighted people that have signed up to help. These are people that have no benefit. They'll never get a paycheck or get entered in a sweepstakes or level up in points or whatever. They just want to help, and it, it doesn't cost them much. Uh, and they're willing to help, and that's that's a simple thing. But when you add it up, 207,000 times someone has been helped across a parking lot, or simply, what button do I push to get a soda that I want? You know, 
all that adds up. It's not very much effort for each individual person, but it's a huge benefit to our society, right? Another, this is, I think, probably an iconic brand now, right? YouTube. So, and yes, I, I actually do read the YouTube blog. Um, and about a month ago, I was reading the, one of their blog posts, and, and they say that um, we now, as a, as a species, as a people, we watch a billion hours of YouTube video every day. One billion hours of time is spent every day watching YouTube. So it's a lot, right? It's a big number. If you figure how many people there are on the earth, that's about eight minutes per person, which for me, that's, you know, that's probably accurate some days, so some days less. But I started thinking about all of those hours of people watching things and finding information. And at first I didn't think this is really uh, like a community thing or a, a social thing. That's you sitting in front of a computer screen watching a video, right? But um, my wife and I, we both love to backpack. We love to be outside. And she is particularly um, obsessed with the Appalachian Trail. And she watches a lot more than eight minutes a day <laughs> a video about the AT. Um, and she's learned an amazing amount of, of information, of facts, um, about where to stay, what to eat, what to expect, what local people are like in different areas. Um, a huge amount, a huge rich tapestry of information that she never would have been able to gather by going to the library and reading a book or um, buying some maps. Um, and she was, we were sitting on the couch um, and she was watching videos and I was looking at the comments on some of the videos that she was watching. And this one, it's probably pretty hard to read because it's small text, but um, someone posted uh, a tip, like this is a way to sleep on the ground without getting sore. And someone else says, wow, yeah, that's, that's what they taught me in the Army. That, that really works. I've, you know, I've done that. And someone else says, uh, great, you've helped me. Like, I, I learned from that. Thank you. And then the next down, there's someone saying, uh, this, is, this is a great channel. I love this channel. Thank you. And someone else says, oh, uh, I know you from your channel. It's, I'm not surprised to see you over here. Welcome. And then another person like, oh, you know, I, I also know your channel, it's great, thank you for posting. And if you go down a little further, there's someone saying, you know, I learned from this and now I'm gonna make a new video and post it that, that fuses a couple of ideas in this thread together. And I thought, how many little pockets of people that care about something deeply and they can connect with each other across this system? So. So yeah, YouTube is changing the way we consume information, but it's also become a platform for people who share a common interest to get together and connect with each other, even if it's around something like how to sleep on the ground. Right. Okay, so when, when we talk about community at Instructure, most people think about community.canvaslms.com. It's a website, you can go there, right? But, um, I think more fundamental than that, um, community it are the, the people who share a common interest, who are highly invested, who come together around a common goal and help each other. And to me, that's that's what that's what the that's what this is about. It's it's the people who are using this platform to connect with each other around the fact that they are educators and that they want to help students and they want to help each other be better educators. And that's, that's, I mean, it's simple, but that's what it's really about. Um, with this website, some of the things that uh, I really like, um, it's highly dynamic. Uh, it's about a relationship between, between the people who are in this room and also between uh, you and the company. And some parts about that that I, I find really powerful are the amount of input that you give to us on how to build the software and that we have a chance to try to explain to you what our decisions are around that. So we get input from you, we get a rich gold mine of information from you on how to try to make a better product. And um, that, if you've participated in that, is a very uh, highly active uh, process. And there's a lot of 
a lot of debate and a lot of talking and a lot of describing and explaining and voting and campaigning and it, and and sometimes it's even it's even a bit acrimonious, but it's 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 great. I mean, we we couldn't buy the kind of feedback we get to try to do what we do um, that we get from you. I like the guides. The guides are the user guides, right? You you can go if you want to learn how to file your grades or you want to do something, you can go and read the guides. But the thing that that I think is the most powerful about them is that at the bottom of every guide topic, there's a comment box. And I don't know how many times you've had the experience that you go online and you type a comment in something and it's, it's gone. Well, um, there are two people at Instructure, and I know them very well because they sit right to my immediate left. That's Emily and then Cody, that read those comments. They read every one of them, and they respond to some of them, and they put, uh, jobs in the backlog for documentation to change the guide articles because of the comments that people make. And so what you have there, it's not a book, it's not a, a guide, it's a living conversation between the writer and the reader. And it, and it grows and it's organic. And it, that's, I think, very cool. And another example, if you haven't participated in it, are around the releases. We, we change the product every three weeks and um, there's release notes that go out. And as soon as they go out, there are people commenting, um, you know, uh, I can't get this to work. And somebody else will say, well, you have to turn on this feature flag. And oh yeah, okay, that works. Or um, were they not thinking? Like they're gonna change this thing and it's gonna kill every you know, part of my course. And um, the last six months, there's been an interesting development where there are a group of, of people, um, some of them are teachers, some of them are administrators, who have decided to get together in a live chat environment. As soon as the release notes come out, they get together and they're chatting and they're, they're exchanging information and testing, and then they come back to us with, uh, with a, a Google Doc that's formed and it says, we have three questions for instructor. We have two concerns. We have one thing that we think you really need to reconsider. And so rather than 280 comments that we're like trying to read through and, you know, to respond to, we get this like fully formed, beautiful response, and we can act on it. So that's again, that's like it's a way to communicate back and forth that fundamentally means we can do our job. Okay. What um, may not be readily apparent when you you go to the <laughs> community website is that uh, community is uh, an integral part of how we do our business internally as well. So if you, for example, are a, a salesperson, say, and you go in the Slack channel and you type a question and say, hey, how, how do I do this thing in Canvas? You're not going to get an answer most of the time. You're going to get, here's where you go and access the knowledge base and find out how to do that thing. Um, we believe that when you give someone access to knowledge, you open the door for them to improve it. So just like people are posting questions and ideas and, and things in the external community that other people are then reading and learning from, we're doing the same thing internally too. We're saying, oh, did you know that at Tacoma Community College they do it a certain way? If you're gonna deal with, with people from Tacoma, know this about Tacoma, right? It's, it's the same thing. It's like it's a hive in, you know, knowledge base thing. Okay, so how many, how many people were using, were active in the Canvas community two and a half years ago. Raise your hands. Okay, cool. So it looks like I'd say a third maybe. Um, those those forums that I talked about that Jason and I were were interacting in back in 2010, at the time were um, you know revolutionary, right? Like it was open, it was free exchange. Um, but as time went on, and more and more people. Um, were in there, they got clogged down, bogged down, it got really hard to find um, what you were looking for, people got frustrated and left, um, and uh, at the time there were about 1,500 people who were in there on some sort of regular basis and maybe 150 who were actively engaging and trying to answer questions and voting and linking, and we thought, wow, we've got this huge group of people that we need to provide a better platform for. And so we, we set up the, the platform that you see today if you go there. And now we have 
Um, I looked this morning, it was 158,632 people that have created accounts in the last couple of years. And on a, an average day, depending on where we are in the academic cycle, you'll have eight to 13,000 who are um, in there clicking and like, uh, clicking and searching and you know, moving around and, and maybe around um, 3,000 people who are linking, liking, voting, responding. So if you, if you it, 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 any day you go into that community, you're going to have around 3,000 people who are eyes on what you're looking at at the same time. So a very vibrant thing. Um, and we try to, the people that build the platform or support the platform, we try to do the same thing that we do with Canvas as a product. We try to make it simple and powerful and out of your way. So you're not thinking about the software, you're thinking about getting the answer to the question that you have or finding the, the group of people who are like you. Okay, so in, in most instances of Canvas, there's an Ask the Community link. So you can go straight from wherever you are in Canvas into the community and, and post a question. If you do that, most of the time, around 90% of the time, you'll get an answer of some sort within 24 hours. Um, within uh, about a week, you'll usually have an answer that's been marked as helpful or marked as correct. And again, um, these are not Canvas employees that are answering these questions. These are our Canvas coaches. We've got one in the room today, Kelly. Um, and, and other users, super users sometimes. Um, but you can get an answer to a question. You can come into the studio portion of the community where the ideas area. And one thing that's new that we just changed about a month ago is you can still go in and suggest a feature idea. Anyone can suggest a feature idea. And then anyone can vote up or vote down on that idea. But we also added in you can now go and see what we are working on right now and what we're going to be working on soon and have an opportunity to influence that. So like we're, right now we're building a new um, Canvas teacher app. And so if you go in, you can see in our list of priorities, here's a way that you could contribute. You can take a survey, you can join a focus group, you can read through um, related feature ideas to this thing and, and, and comment and, and reasonably know that the input, the time that you're spending doing that is going to be looked at and used immediately in helping the development process. Not six months from now, not a year from now, but right now, this is what we're working on. And we really do need your input on that. There are user groups that you can join. Um, how many people in the room here have joined one user group? Awesome. Cool. Glad to see Doug's hand shoot up in the back there. <laughs> um, so saying, yeah, there are user groups. You can go and join the librarians group or the instructional design group. That's easy to say that. But specific examples of why I think this is really cool. Um, here's a, a blog post by Don Bryn. And he's saying, um, here, here's a problem I'm having today in Canvas that I'm trying to solve. Here's what I, here's what I want it to look like. And then um, people are collaborating around finding a solution to that problem. So. Um, you can go and find this thread using PHP to improve your page design, and you'll find a whole list of people who have worked around this issue, worked on this issue, and, and changed it, made it better. So people are, are actually working together. Um, here's a blog post by, by Kelly Musen. Um, share UDL design tips and tricks. And the thing that jumped out about me to me about this was he said, uh, you are all more than welcome to disagree with me, and if you do, I hope you will join this conversation. So you, he want, it's, it's not that Kelly wants to be right or win an argument or prove how smart he is. He wants to have an actual authentic conversation, right? And, and an exchange, free exchange of ideas. And one more, um, Stephanie Sanders, who's been in the community longer than there was a community, uh, and she's actually now the, the, the most latest new full-time community manager at Instructure. And she, in this post, she's saying there are resources and things all around the community around Canvas Commons, around repositories. And here I've curated, I've gone through, and I've created a, 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 a table that has all these different resources. Please help me to curate this knowledge. So gather and curate. 
again, like we could hire a thousand people with documentation and we'll, we won't get the amount of curated knowledge that the community builds itself. Okay. So I talked about a little bit about the community platform and some of the things that are happening at Instructure with, you know, with Canvas. And, um, and I talked in, in about some other uh, community things that are happening out on the internet. Um, when I was thinking about all this, I was thinking the way that we interact with each other is in the last few years has, I think, fundamentally changed as a society. Right? If I wanted to know how to do something or I want to learn about something, I go find it myself. If I have a question, I feel free to ask other people for help. I'm going to go on the internet and say to perfect strangers, please help me. I don't know something or I need help. And, and uh, I, that's just like second nature for us today. And that's what our students are doing. If they want to know how to do something, they pick up YouTube, you know. Um, and I was thinking about people in our system who uh, are reacting to that, you know, the world that their students live in. Um, if, you're, if you're from Washington and you've been here for, for a long time, um, you may not know that outside of Washington, you all have a reputation for <laughs> no, you do. You do. If, if you're if you're from Washington and you go around the country and you say I'm from Washington, people say, "Oh, because you guys are innovative. You do you do cool stuff before other people do." Um, OER has been a been a big thing here for a long time. You know, flip flip classroom. It's like old hat for people here. But you go to different places in the country and they're like, "What is that?" You know, it's it's not it's not old hat for them. Um, so thinking about that, I looked at examples of people in, in Washington. Is, is Mark, are, are you here today, Mark? No? OK. So Mark Gaither, did a, he did a presentation at InstructureCon last year. He's from Lower Columbia, um, works with Nadine in, in business department. Um, and they, they, he and his colleagues uh, asked the question, well, what, do we, what happens if we say to the student, here are, the, here are the objectives. This is what we need to do. Now you tell me how this course is going to run. You tell me how we're going to structure this. And we'll work together. He's, you know, the, it, he's still there. Like the, 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 the card is not going to go seriously off the track. But he's going to let the students participate in designing and building the course that they're going to take. Uh, that's awesome. Students that grow up in this environment of I can go find information, I can go find people like me, I can participate in communities and network, uh, I think are going to respond very well to this kind of approach. Another example is uh, Laura Gibbs. She's a, a uh, creative writing teacher. And you can actually find it in the community. But she, one of the cool things she did is she took all of her student feedback from like the last 15 years and she um, keyword search through it and then organize the, the comments from the students around different topics like you know, the learning platform, the, the grading policy, um, you know, all the different technologies that she used. Asked all these questions about her own teaching and then searched the student feedback and categorized, okay, these are the things my students are saying about this aspect of how we teach. And then she published it all online. She shared it so other teachers can look at it. And I wanted to grab one of those quotes. It's a long one, so I'll read it to you. This course is probably the best I have ever taken at OU. Wow, it required a lot of work, effort, and time, but I learned so much. Laura makes it very easy to be successful in this class, but has structured the course so that one must put in the work and time. She also encourages independent thinking and ownership over the work by giving us freedom to choose topics for our projects and allowing us our own creative liberties. So I, I was like, well, OK, I need to know more about that. So I talked to her, and I found out that the way that her course runs is she's teaching, she's teaching people how to write. And she, rather than saying, OK, there are you know, there's 10 weeks, and there are 10 topics and 10 assignments, and you must do those things, and then I will grade them, and then you will write again, and I'll grade it. Um, she says, OK, here's a whole um, list of things that you can choose from. And you need to do a certain minimum amount of writing, but you can basically set up your own uh, your own writing that you're going to do. 
and then you are going to read your, your fellow students' work, and you're going to comment on it, and you're going to read their comments on your work. And she, I mean, she gives a grade because she has to, but really, fundamentally, what she wants people to do is to write, and then let their peers read it, and then take that feedback into account, and then choose another writing assignment, and say, you know, based on what I've, the feedback I've gotten, I'm going to write again, and here are my goals in writing again. And it's all, it's all public, it's all out there, so, so people can see it. So again, she's, she changed the focus. So the focus is not on, on me, the teacher, or teaching you. It's more, I'm the learner, I'm gonna figure out how to learn, and then I'm going to get feedback from the people around me who are gonna help me, and I'm gonna help them. We're all gonna learn together. I would love to take her class. Okay, one more story, okay. How many people know who this guy is, anyone? Yeah, one, two? Okay, so Stacy Peralta uh, is a skateboarder. He uh, was, did, did some pretty amazing things as a skater. By the time I was in high school, um, uh, they had uh, Powell Peralta was a, a company, right? And um, we would look at things that this guy would do and think, I wanna be like that guy, right? I wanna be able to do those things. And in 1984, Stacy um, created a, a Bones Brigade video, skate video. It's the first skate video. Uh, really low production value, um, just kids out on the street skating. And they created this video to sell skateboards. Um, they thought if we take the video and we put it into skateboard stores, people will come in and they'll say, that's cool, I want to do that. I'm going to buy that skateboard. And they did. But what they did more than that is the kids came into the skate shops and they said, I want to buy that video. How do I get that video? Because this was, this was kids doing things on the videos that the kids in the skate shops had never seen before. And um, if this was at the advent of the, the VHS or Beta Max technology where you could, record, uh, you could record videos and pass them around to your friends, right? And so this sparked a movement where kids were going out on the street and videotaping themselves and then passing the tapes around, mailing them to their friends in other states or whatever. And the effect was, um, Stacy talks about it in a YouTube video you can go watch. Skating in America fundamentally changed. Kids that were mediocre skaters became really good skaters. Good skaters became phenomenal skaters. Kids that never thought they could skate, uh, skated. And, and it was because the kids who knew how to do something would put themselves out there, they'd record themselves or their friends, pass it around, those kids would look at it and say, I can do that, and they'd go try it. And then they'd come back and say, you know, I've, I learned how to ollie and now I, I, I improved it. And then and they put that out, right? So it's, it's fundamentally, you have to have an example, and then you think about it and you realize, I can do that, and then you go do it and then you share back, right? Simple. Okay, so uh, some of you have been doing this for a long time. Some of you are new to this. And when I say this, I mean teaching, education, the different technologies involved. And so I have a, a, just a simple request, call to action. If, you're, if you are doing this already, uh, share. Come to the community if you haven't already and post about what you do. If you're new to this, come use this vehicle, participate in one discussion, watch one video, join one Canvas Live session, and then take what you learn, go do it, and come back and share it. Thank you.